Good evening, everyone. Uh, so I'll be talking on one of the debatable talk topics uh, in uh, pediatric uh, ophthalmology, which is infantile esotopia. So I'll be talking about the issues which are debatable in this. So whenever we see a baby like this, which I've shown in these photographs out here, so we need to see, do we need to intervene early? What is it, uh, reliability of measurements in these children? Obviously, it is very, very difficult. And we have to be careful because obviously this is a period when the exposure to general anesthesia, a lot of studies which have said that larger the number of exposures, longer the time of exposures, all these are very, very harmful for the brains, uh, brain of the developing child. And also we have to look for the delayed overcorrection, especially if we are doing large amounts of surgery in these children. So again, that is another thing which is to be taken care of. And obviously, if you are doing delayed surgeries, the role of accommodation, which comes into play at around two and a half years of age, that also has to be taken, especially if there is a high AC by A ratio. And the other coexisting abnormalities, along with the esotropia in these children, there may be associated over invariably overactions, there may be DVDVs, all those also have to be taken care of. So the total number of surgeries in these patients over the lifetime. So all this is a very, very complex issue. So that's why there are lots of things which are debatable in this. First thing which I'll be talking about regarding this is the timing of intervention, whether we should be intervening early or late. So the school of thought from where this all this process started, whether in early intervention should be done or not, was can ophthalmologists, as an ophthalmologist, can we repair the all those neurological developments which are delayed or which are at not in a normal phase in patients with infantile azotopia? With early surgery, obviously, Earlier, the, anything, if you are able to align the eyes, obviously the stereopsis and the binocularity development would be better. Even if you are able to bring it to the category of monofixation syndrome, that is within 8 to 10 prism diopters of residual esotropias, that is transferring a patient from a large angle esotropia to a small monofixation syndrome, that is what is a Marks, uh, Marshall Park's legacy, which says that obviously that would allow us to allow the child to develop some amount of binocular, uh, binocularity. And what is more important out here is not exactly operating them very early, but operating them within early, as early as within 60 days or within two months of the onset of esotropia. That is the most important. So whatever is required is to align them as early as possible after the onset of their esotropia. So that is what is required. And obviously, we, we have various studies which show the quality of stereopsis would be better in those cases. Also, there have been studies which have shown the effect uh, of this early intervention on cortical motion VER, and they have shown that adequate binocular alignment done during the critical period, as I mentioned earlier, gives better outcomes on M MVEP, especially so the trend on this scene on the multi these multifocal VEPs was that if you do early surgery within 10 months for these children, obviously the results are better. That is indirectly indicative that their binocularity can develop if you are operating them at that particular age. So as I mentioned, early surgery, the pros for, or the pros which are in favor of early surgery is a better binocularity. Multiple studies are there. LA study, Birch has done various studies, all of which have said that at around age six, if we compare the children who have had early surgeries before the age of one year, or if we compare those who have had late surgeries around three years or two and a half, three years of age, obviously the stereopsis, the basic stereopsis or the gross stereopsis is better in the group which has had early surgeries. Although the final quality of stereopsis may not be as good for both the groups, but at least the uh, absence of stereopsis or gross stereopsis would be present definitely in those who have had an early surgeries. Better binocularity, better binocular visual fields, better, and all this together would help in developing a better visual behavior of the child, which will uh, help in acquiring all those motor skills also, which are part crossly, closely linked to his visual behavior. And a better cosmetic appearance always along with that. So usually the trend is now to operate uh, for, the, for the, all the proponents who are for early surgery is to operate them within the good framework of six to 12 months of age, pre preferably before eight months of age. Uh, however, the cons which are for early surgery, as we know, this is very, very young child, exactly knowing whether it is actually an infantile misalignment or is it, or is just a misalignment, which is a, a temporary thing, or which is only a, which may spontaneously resolve, or is it actually a true strabismus? That is sometimes may become difficult to differentiate. Some children have shown spontaneous resolution, especially with smaller angles. That was what was shown in the congenital esotropia observation study, and also in the pe uh, pe uh, some pedigroup studies, which show that deviation less than 30 diopters, around 20 diopters, or mild milder forms of deviation may show some spontaneous resolution, especially if the patients are examined very early in life at around 20 weeks of age. Uh, Again, other thing is about 49% of these children may have 
coexisting. I'm not talking about cases of essential infantile esotropia who do not have a systemic or a neurological abnormality. But if we s overall take the prevalence of infantile esotropia, that uh, about roughly around 40 to 50 percent of these children have associated systemic or neurological abnormalities. And these children usually may present at a variable age, may not present as early as possible. And these patients with CP may be diagnosed much later. And there, the results of surgery are very variable, very unpredictable. So in these cases, the binocularity and all those things which you're looking for are all secondary. They, the other things, the other motor uh, delays, the other neurological delays take a priority for the parents as well as for the medical, uh, uh, develop, uh, medical development of the child per se. Uh, the pros for, for the uh, uh, proponents of late surgery group, they said obviously there is, as we know, younger the child, difficulty in strabismus measurements, so all the me measurements, the effect of the retractive error, as it has said, we do not know what is the impact of the accommodation which is going to come up in the late, later years. The concerns regarding general anesthesia, which I've already dis discussed, also doing difficulty in these, uh, difficulty of doing the surgery per se in these eyes, which are very, very small eyes, what are uh, assessing the force duction, doing force duction testing, uh, testing for these children. Again, assessment of these tests is also very difficult. So all these uh, factors are in favor of those who are the pro late pro uh, proponents of late surgeries. And also the poor outcome predictions, which and the fear which is there in the parents amongst uh, the fear of overcorrection, undercorrection, multiple surgery, which is, which is a fear in the surgeons as well. And also these uh, proponents of late surgery, they say that does esotropia actually matter in terms of stereopsis? Because as said, in some of the studies, it has been seen that the although the gross stereopsis would develop, but the fine stereopsis still, even by when we are doing an early surgery, as early as around. 10 months of age may not be to that extent as it would for a normal child. So does that performance of not having good, very good near severity, does it actually make a difference if we're operating them early? So these are the factors which are going in favor of those who are propo uh, proposing a late surgeries. Uh, and also worldwide, if you look at these figures, uh, most of the children do not report to us at, at the time when we actually can do the early surgeries, especially in a country like ours, most of the children are coming to us very late because either they are def not approaching us directly as ophthalmologists, they're going to the pediatrician who still in present day-to-day uh, -day times are saying, no, maybe the child, when the child grows up, the eyes will straighten up because sometimes they're confusing the pseudo isotropias as isotropias and which they're probably differing. So the children report to us very late when they've already crossed that age of early, uh, period of early surgery. So early surgery, obviously as an ophthalmologist, as a pediatric ophthalmologist, I am a proponent of early surgery and I would say obviously it has a hopeful prediction, at least if I am able to give them even gross stereopsis, I would prefer and go ahead with the early surgeries. Late surgeries from the parent's point of view, from the anesthesia point of view, they are easy to justify. But ag again, if we have to go for a consensus, uh, I would take the opinion of the uh, panelist and the chairperson later on uh, when I finish my talk. Obviously, early surgery, if you are able to operate them somewhere before the age of one year, that would be better at least to attain some gross stereopsis. And then the second controversy which is there in the field of uh, infantile isotropias is whether to do surgery first or whether in this early period to use Botox or the botulinum toxin. There have been studies which have shown botulinum toxin being used as a primary treatment and s stable satisfactory results have been obtained. Again, their degree of deviation is important in these cases. It reduces the total amount of uh, uh, deviations. For example, we are dealing with large deviation by giving some amount of Botox, we are bringing it to an uh, extent of 10 to 15 uh, diopters of uh, residual isotropias, which could help in achieving some binocularity. So obviously, Botox, using Botox as primary treatment is what is these proponents of uh, Botox as a primary treatment which are uh, proposing as. It allows for the development of binocularity and allows the prejudice to be carried for smaller angles which we are, where we are not planning surgeries. And this is one of the meta-analyses which was done with Botox as the primary treatment where there were nine uh, studies and the group success rate found in the study was around, this, the nine meta-analyses was 76% and it, the mean change in deviation which was achieved with a single Botox injection, and the mean injections were given about 1.4 injections and the amount of uh, uh, deviation which could be corrected with this was around 30 percent diopters. The dose varied according to the body weight of the uh, child and uh, effect was lasting for around uh, three months. Although the complications on are known with Botox, like consecutive uh, exotropias and ptosis and vertical deviations can occur after uh, Botox injections. Again, there's another study which shows an inverse association between dose and the success rate and uh, uh, more effective and there is, a, uh, they use this for, uh, for cases which has a larger deviation, 30 to 35 prism diopters. And they showed success rate to be 51% if it was less than 30 prism diopters and more than uh, uh, 
uh, around 40 percent if it, is, it was more than 30 percent diopters. But there was a good gain in the binocular vision, both with the visit assays using the Babylonian striated glasses, as well as there was an improvement in gauze rhodopsis in the bottom group, uh, which was compared with that of the surgical group. Uh, again, there's another study where Gorsalara, which has all again shown, in this study they did not find any significant difference in the binocularity, which was attained in the bottom group as a, uh, versus the surgical treatment group. And the median, but the median age of treatment was earlier in the Botox group in their study. So the general protocol, how it is given is basically, obviously using a sevoflurane mask, you do not, need not give a full anesthesia and uh, no EMG is required. You don't just can give it either as a transconjunctival injection or you can di dissect the conjunctiva and directly inject into the belly of the muscle and into, into the tendon of the muscle. And what was propagated by, is being propagated nowadays is the five international abundant toxin in each MR and uh, for uh, which is equivalent to 0.05 ml for all ages using a 27 gauge needle which is one millimeter long uh, one millimeter uh, uh, one millimeter ml syringe and injection time taken is only one minute so the duration of anesthesia is not very long for this and it can be done under mask anesthesia as i told you uh, but the other proponent uh, uh, which is not in favor of uh, botox which is saying surgery is the only treatment for this obviously says that we obviously we do not know about this anomaly whether it is just a neural anomaly whether, why is the angle so variable in these cases? Is the potential for binocular injection predetermined? And what is the window of opportunity? So there, why waste the window of opportunity by using repeated Botox injections? Because you will have to repeat them. So this group then proposes, obviously, alignment with Botox. We are not able to go beyond a particular uh, deviation, amount of deviation. We cannot, it does not give us a full correction or, or the acceptable correction uh, in patients who have more than 40 diopters. So then restoring alignment by surgery is the best. Obviously, we'll have a prolonged period, a sustained period of good alignment, which will help in achieving a good binocularity. And obviously, incidence of undercorrection in these cases would be lesser. So let's examine the evidence for the surgical group. Uh, obviously, it has been seen by Yagasaki et al., where the duration of good alignment was very long. So obviously, within eight prism diopters, which is strongly correlated with the better binocularity, better sensory outcomes, giving us more consistent results as opposed to botulinum toxin. Number of GAs would obviously on not require, repeated GAs would not be required unless until he develops uh, secondary inferior overactions or DVDs, then when they will require a second surgeries. And um, so, and the cost, cost issues also would be cut down. Obviously, Botox, repeated uh, procedures required, repeated cost of Botox, all those factors are not in favor of. Obviously, would uh, help a person or who is in favor of or a proponent of surgical group. So those factors play in favor of him. But there are few studies being done which are now proposing a combined treatment. So consensus, I would say now is moving towards a combined treatment where there are six RCTs which are going on at present, where they're saying that increased success rate can be done when the two procedures are combined. So if it is less than 40 present diopters of your ESO deviation is present, then you can just do your surgeries, bimedial resections. But if it is greater than 40 PDs in single sitting, you can do a bimedial resections along with the injection of Botox toxin into the MR. So the consensus surgery remains the primary treatment, box, Botox, use it as an adjunct. This is the latest uh, RCTs uh, which are now working on it, so which is pointing to that. The third debatable issue in infantile isotropia is unilateral versus bilateral surgeries. There's not much debate left on this now. Most of the people are now preferring to do, if the, there are small deviations which can be corrected with the biomedial recessions of six millimeters, patient, uh, p uh, so the orthopedic orthologists are preferring to do a biomedial recessions. If you need to add on, uh, uh, for a larger deviation, add on a s another muscle, then you can would go to for a bilateral surgery and touch an LR of one of the other eyes if you're not doing a combined procedure of Botox. So that is one. MR weakening otherwise suffices in most of the cases. Bilateral MRF suffice. So is a useful strategy. So that is a consensus now. Now the next question is, uh, which is our debate to, is whether to touch the inferior obliques at the time of the primary sitting itself or the primary horizontal surgery or not. Uh, there have been studies which have shown that DVDs, infrabic overactions, may over a period of six, five to six years, when we follow up this child, even when they are operated for ho only horizontal surgeries during their uh, early infancy, uh, around 72% of congenital isotropias develop these secondary overactions. Uh, at an uh, and these are usually seen in an average of around three, three to four years of age. And incidence was positively related to the number of horizontal surgeries which the child ha has. And it has been seen that seven if inferior oblique was touched in one eye, the other eye subsequently may develop an inferior oblique overaction. While in milder cases, this may not happen. The horizontal surgery itself may be helpful in correcting the mild inferior oblique overaction. Uh, and hence, it was, has been seen that reconnaissance may occur even if we have touched the inferior oblique in the primary setting in 20% of the cases. So when to operate inferior oblique, that is again a debatable issue. 
So first we have to assess whether there is a primary infeoblique overaction or not. So it may not be very easy to determine it at a very young age or when there is a large angle of isotropia when it will look like a pseudo infeoblique overaction. We may not be able to judge whether it is actually a primary infeoblique overaction or not. So in these cases what we can do is we can look for other, like we should be ruling out that it is not secondary to a superior oblique palsy. So we should look for any torsional head postures, we should look for depression defects and if we are able to capture their images on fundus camera in the OT or uh, under uh, mask anesthesias, then only we would th say that it is okay primary infeoblique reaction, we can think of touching it. Otherwise, uh, there's no point unless and until we are sure that there's a primary infeoblique reaction. At the time of the primary surgery, you should not go ahead with that. And also DVD has to be taken care of, which would usually appear late after three to four years of age. So as I said, we should treat inferior oblique only when, there is, when we are sure that there's an elevation uh, in adduction is there. There is a significant V pattern. Inferior oblique action is more than the isotropia, which means isotropia is only four to 10 prism diapers. I'm just giving you an example. And it is only primary inferior oblique action, which is obvious in the child. Then obviously you go ahead with the inferior oblique surgeries. Or if it is significant, as I said, more than two plus or three, or we have objectively documented an ex version in these cases, then we can, okay, go ahead with the primary inferior oblique uh, surgery at the time of horizontal surgery as well. Uh, no modification otherwise is required when you are doing this in the intended horizontal surgery. You do your horizontal surgery uh, amounts the same as they have you decided uh, based upon his uh, isodivations. And uh, the surgery which is preferred in these cases obviously is recession. No myotomies is to be done because we cannot grade the myotomies. And if it's, as I said, if it is an extreme case of inferior oblique overaction, when you know it is a primary inferior oblique action of a, a large angle, then probably you can think of even doing an entronasal transposition. The last uh, talk in this is, this is again not much of debate left on this, occlusion before surgery or after surgery. Most of these cases of infantile isotropias, per se, when they present to us early, within the first two years of life, because they usually have cross fixation and they switch over fixation in the primary gaze, so they do not have amblyopia. So the question of giving them occlusion therapy before surgery usually does not arise. If amblyopia usually tends to develop later, later on in years once the accommodative element comes in. So if that element is there, if they, when they're presenting to us late at the age of two and a half, three years, that time obviously if the refraction is showing us significant accommodative element, then we should think of in terms of amblyopia. And that time obviously you will have to give amblyopia therapy because at that time even your stereopsis is not going to be much affected even if you delay the surgery by another six months or one year before when you're treating them for occlusion therapy. So two hours of patching according to the age of the child at that time, especially in these cases when, I said, when there is an accommodated component along with it. Thank you.